that saving time means saving money. Save time on your accounting solution. Use FreshBooks cloud accounting software. FreshBooks makes easy accounting software with a friendly UI that transforms how entrepreneurs and small business owners deal with a day-to-day paperwork. Get ready for the simplest way to be more productive and organized, and most importantly, get paid quickly. FreshBooks is not only easy to use, it's also packed full of powerful features. From the visually appealing dashboard, you can see outstanding revenue, spending, reports, a notification center, and action items at a glance. Create and send invoices in less than 30 seconds. Set up online payments with just a couple clicks. Your clients can pay by credit card straight from their invoice. And if you send an invoice, you can see when the client has received and opened that invoice. FreshBooks is also known for award-winning customer service, and a real live person usually answers the phone in three rings or less. FreshBooks is offering a 30-day unrestricted free trial to Software Engineering Daily listeners. To claim it, just go to freshbooks.com sed and enter Software Engineering Daily in the How Did You Hear About Us section. Again, that's freshbooks.com slash S-E-D. Thanks to FreshBooks for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Thank you so much for your time, George. I appreciate it a lot. First of all, I would like us to kind of discuss the history, I guess, in Kenya of how 10 to 15 years ago, the population was unbanked. Mm-hmm. And now they're quite big with banking on their on their mobile phones and paying for things on their mobiles. Can you just talk me through the evolution of payments in Kenya of the last decade or so? Okay, so just like many African countries, one of the biggest things that that's happened over the last couple of decades is we've had the entry of mobile phones and the internet at the same time and what that has done to not only the ecosystem but also the consumer is that the consumer has learned to adopt and also use different elements of technology in a very rapid sense so when you associate the internet in in the first world it's something that you do on your computer it's certain services that are customized for the computer And then you have this other world where the entry of the internet and the entry of the mobile phone have kind of coincided. And so what our everyday consumer considers a normal internet transaction is actually the mobile version of the more advanced systems that we're used to on the internet. And so what has happened also is that a lot of the developers and a lot of the new users and a lot of the new use cases are coming from environments that are very unique to here because of just the way we have adopted and understood both technology and the internet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when we talk about somebody being unbanked, what does that actually mean? Just because of, of how our geographical locations are placed and banking is still a fairly new, you'll find a lot of countries on this side have only been independent 40, 50 years And so banking is a very new thing. Before 50 years from now, they had, you know, their their barter trade and they had their all this round table banking and things like those. So the commercial banking in the in the region is only maybe 20, 30 years old. And so a lot of the new people still consider it a foreign concept. And and so the option, I mean, if you look at a, a user or a person who who keeps their surplus income somewhere in a house or with a group of people, the opportunity to then be able to keep and access money on your phone, to access money on on wallets, to get sent money from abroad. And I think that could be a place where that that began. And even how we ended up creating things like M-Pesa is because you have all these people who leave Africa and are going to the States or to Europe and they're sending money back home. And the model around that is that you'll get a text message or an email that says, hey, you've been sent $100 by your brother John. 
and then you head over to a place and they give you the hundred dollars off of this message and we took that idea and like evolved it into a whole monster where now everybody even within the country is able to then send money the same format of like the closest I'd imagine is like a Western Union or something like that. So to be able to send that in real time and then have enough points of access where you can go and pull them out. So where if I signed up to a bank, I do have to go to my specific bank or to a specific branch to withdraw. With something like mobile money, I'm able to go to millions of little agents who are in kiosks so I can go to ATMs or I can go to different vending points or I could just send it virtually to somebody else without having to step into a bank and that just changed the way we transact with money on this side okay in my research when I was looking at the payments across Africa Kenya came up again and again as a leading player especially with your M PESA system now how was that developed and how has it helped Kenya become a leading player globally in fact with payments on mobile? Well, M-Pesa is is tied to one mobile network and that's possibly the most unique thing about Kenya and why Kenya would pop up quite a bit. It's the only market in the region where you have one almost monopoly player in the telco space. So out of a 47 million population probably 35 or 30 million of those people are on one mobile network. And so this mobile network then developing a system where you're able to transact money within the network using just your SIM your SIM card. So this application is already installed onto your SIM card and anybody else on the network, you're able to transfer money between your SIM and their SIM. And yes. If you consider 30 million people, there's very few banks that are holding 30 million (laughs) active accounts that are moving money daily between each other. And so that is one of the reasons. And this has grown steadily over 10 years. So it started as, and the reason why I think it, it became big, it started as just a service that was being offered to the unbanked. So when it was introduced, as opposed to banking, which is looking for who's the guy with the most money or who's the guy doing transactions, This system was based around everybody has a little money that they need to send to so-and-so, to somebody else. And so how can we make sure that person, as opposed to having to go deposit in a bank, can be able to make transactions as quickly and as easily as possible? And then that just became adopted across the board. So everybody from the people in the villages to your CEOs to new people, experts who come in here, you'll walk into shops or you'll go to some of the game parks and you can't even pay with cash anymore. They've replaced cash completely with this virtual mode of payment. Okay, okay. Yeah. So clearly it's it's become part and parcel of everyday life in Kenya. And yeah. um, yes. I, I always and tell I, it to I, people when, when hmm. if, if there's somebody who hasn't experienced it before and they're trying to compare it to a mobile wallet somewhere, I always say the closest thing you can compare it to is cash because it's the only thing that's <laughs> stress. It's not like a wallet which people are adopting anymore. This is now more valuable than cash. There are people you'll meet and they'll be like, just send it to my phone. I, it's safer for me to have on my phone than to carry cash around. Oh, really? Oh, yes. wow. That is interesting. And I wonder, Safaricom, I believe, is the network that is behind M-Pesa. Yes, correct. correct. And there are... A forty percent owned, I think, by Vodafone UK. Correct. I understand that initially M Pesa became was started as a way to send out micro loans to people, but then instead of people using it for that purpose, they began sending money to family, to friends, to to relatives. So how much outside influence has there been on M Pesa in Kenya from outside the country? Very little, actually. So a lot of it has grown and evolved based on the local consumer. You'll also see that, I mean, because of the Vodacom influence, the product has moved into several markets. They've tried it in the South. They have it in in several of the East African countries. And you find that the core of it was built for Kenya based on a Kenyan consumer. And so the challenge, even when you look at M-Pesa, is when you move into some other markets it doesn't operate as 
efficiently when you don't have that 90% market share that is the advantage on one side. So the second uh-huh. you have to go cross network or or enter bank or something that it complicates the model a little bit. So a mm-hmm. lot of it was built and evolved around the Kenyan consumer and it has been tried in other markets, some successful and some unsuccessfully, mm-hmm. but a lot yes. of it was built based on Kenya and Kenya is still its most successful market. Yes, and that actually brings me to my next question. Across Africa, you've got different systems of paying by mobile. For example, in my home country of Zimbabwe, we have Eco Cash, for instance. In Nigeria, I think you've got Paga. Uh, yes. In Ghana, you've got ZPay. Uh-huh. So this diversity, is it good or is it a hindrance in your in your opinion? So when we were getting into online, and online is where you start to see that play. So within the local countries, what is happening is each of these markets has developed its own little payment system that if you go to the different countries, there's an M-Pesa equivalent that has that kind of market share yes. that's doing those kind of numbers. What separates us and what makes the things not as big is that we have within Africa, within the billion people, we probably have 20 of those systems in operation. And each of them is separated by geography, by currency, by governing. Everything is different in each individual market. And so the challenge with that is that no matter how big M-Pesa was on mobile here in Nairobi, I still am not able to M-Pesa somebody next door in Tanzania. Or I wasn't Mm -hmm. able to send an M-Pesa to Uganda because then they're on a different version of the mobile money. They're using a different currency and all those. But when you look at internet and online transactions and e-commerce, the internet has broken some of those barriers already. So when I post up an image of a product I'm trying to sell, the people who like it in Zimbabwe will see it and they'll probably want to to click and buy. And Mm. the guys in Tanzania, for example, and the guys in Kenya. And for us, the challenge has been how do we make sure that the consumer in each of those markets is able to transact or complete the transaction easily whether in their local currency or using credit cards and we are able to settle to the merchant in whichever country there is so each individual market has cracked mobile money and that's step one but the step two in that evolution of payments is how do we move that same mobile money efficiency online and that actually brings me on to MOOC and obviously you co-founded MOOC with your partners to kind of help merchants in the country sell their goods. Now, before you came along with MOOC, what was the state of e-commerce platforms in Kenya in general? So I'd give you two scenarios of what e-commerce was. And this was five, six years, what, five years ago when we started MOOC, 2012, when we began to develop the idea. And the scenario was two. You have the bigger players who had read the trends and they saw that e-commerce and online trade is the big the big thing of the future and they've gone and paid web developers a ton of money to build them an e-commerce store, the coveted e-commerce stores. Yes. So, so they have a website and it's been plugged into a PayPal or a Stripe or something that then the challenge with those becomes that none of those had local integration. So when you then looked at the online stores that were set up, those online stores were set up using, and when you look especially at the payment, which is the core of that entire ecosystem, that payment was happening outside of the local, outside of of whatever the local currency was. And then for those smaller businesses that did have the infrastructure or the finances to go and build an e-commerce store, they moved to Facebook and other social channels like those which offer you free, almost free access to your audience. And they would then post up products and run what we call an informal Juakali kind of sector of e-commerce yeah. where you'd post up a picture and you'd tell all the people who follow you, hey, if you want to buy this, send us a WhatsApp or an inbox and then we'll get back to you. And you'd find like 200 comments of, Do you have it in this color? Do you have it in this size? How many pieces? And so our version of e-commerce was more like a social conversation. 
And for us, when we looked at that, we were like, okay, there's a gap between the merchant who's able to go and set up this whole e-commerce store and plug in an international payment channel. But then there's also a need for us to develop a solution for this little merchant who's spending all day on their Facebook comments, responding back and forth about products and trying to close one or two deals every single day. Is there a way to automate that process and allow their customers to pay using local currency? For years, when I started building a new app, I would use MongoDB. Now, I use MongoDB Atlas. MongoDB Atlas is the easiest way to use MongoDB in the cloud. It's never been easier to hit the ground running. MongoDB Atlas is the only database as a service from the engineers who built MongoDB. The dashboard is simple and intuitive but it provides all the functionality that you need. The customer service is staffed by people who can respond to your technical questions about Mongo. With continuous backup, VPC peering, monitoring, and security features, MongoDB Atlas gives you everything you need from MongoDB in an easy-to-use service. And you could forget about needing to patch your Mongo instances and keep it up to date, because Atlas automatically updates its version. Check out mongodb.com slash sedaily to get started with MongoDB Atlas and get $10 credit for free. And even if you're already running MongoDB in the cloud, Atlas makes migrating your deployment from another cloud service provider trivial with its live import feature. Get started with a free three-node replica set no credit card is required. As an exclusive offer for Software Engineering Daily listeners, use code SEDAILY for $10 credit when you're ready to scale up. Go to mongodb.com slash SEDAILY to check it out. And thanks to MongoDB for being a repeat sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. It means a whole lot to us. And, and I'm guessing as you're looking at this and thinking of ideas, M-Peso really was the thing that made it possible because you had an audience, the merchants and the consumers, used already to paying for items and goods with their, with their phones. Exactly. So I'm guessing that's where you came along and you kind of targeted that area? Exactly. So we sat and, and we were, at that point, we were trying to sell a physical product ourselves. So we were the merchant. We weren't even trying to be... Okay, what was the product? We were trying to sell a heat patch. It was a okay. heat patch for women, so it it helps to reduce period pains, and it was our most brilliant idea in <laughs> life at that point. And mm. we'd brought in the product, we'd done the packaging and some very good marketing material. We'd managed to get it into, I think, like 20-something chemists and all the major supermarkets. But then we realized that the biggest hassle in that was one, going around all these different outlets where we've put our product to just figure out how the stock is moving. And then two, we were marketing on Facebook like the, the other merchants that we, we had seen. So we were on Facebook telling guys, hey, this is the hottest product in town. You can go and buy it at Supermarket X. And at that point, we have no means of measuring whether or not we complete the sale, whether the consumer goes. And we almost lost them for a bit until the next time they needed us. And then they'd come and ask, hey, where can we find you? And we'd redirect them somewhere. So we started to mm -hmm. think of a way that we could complete that transaction during that conversation. If there was a way that online I could tell them, how many pieces do you want to order? Pay to this number. I'll get one of our riders to come and deliver the thing to your house or to your office. And... As we were thinking of that, we started to think of what would be the best way to automate it completely so that without me then having to only do that when a customer has reached out, can we provide the avenue for them to always be able to get onto the platform, select their items, shop, pay, have the item delivered to them, 
and just make it quick and easy for us as the business to manage our numbers, but even for the customers to just access the product, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on a website, whether it's a WhatsApp link. And so we started to just build this whole engine. And MOOC, the name actually means money, right, mm-hmm. in, in local slang. So it's Sheng slang, there's a word called Mukwanja, which means money. And yes. so we, we were just trying to figure out a way to collect money online. That was our core, <laughs> our okay. core, core challenge at that time. Okay. Yeah. So if I'm correct, you operate on Facebook, on Twitter, and also Instagram, if I'm correct. Yes. So what we do yes. is, is once you set up as a merchant on our page, we create for you a unique URL or a unique store that you're able to syndicate across your social platforms or your website. So basically the same store that you have on MOOC, you're able to have that on your Facebook page. You're able to have that as a direct bio link on your Instagram. And the advantage of this over an aggregator, which is very big on this side. So you have a lot of stores in Africa that are also just like we have 1,000 merchants who we put online and everybody comes and buys from us. But for us, it's everything is centered on the merchant and the merchant's audience. So you don't share your audience with other people who are running competing businesses. When people see your link, they click it and it brings them directly to your store. They've literally walked into your storefront at that point. Okay, okay. A lot of your kind of clients and consumers are accessing the stores on mobile. In an interview you did prior to him, I think it was it with Scott Hanselman, you spoke about how it took you nine months to make an API to make the whole process seamless. How did you go about doing that? Doing that. So one of the challenges you find, especially in a in a young ecosystem like what we have in Nairobi, is that there's existing things. So you'll see an existing product like M-Pesa, and you assume, "Wow, this is excellent. Let's go and find ways to plug into it." But a lot of it is built from scratch there's no other use cases that we can go back to and research and then benchmark on you literally have to look learn and adapt and so we initially thought that we would just go plug in a, an mpesa pay bill or plug in one or two card options and we'd be running in no time but you realize that especially for online so we were basing our assumptions on the fact that mobile money and mobile transactions are so big so moving that to online would be seamless but it that's what the part that took us nine months because then you realize oh okay none of this is built for automatic callbacks none of (laughs) it is built for you know there's the little things that you don't think about when you're doing mobile because it's straightforward But if then I don't want to have to get an SMS, which is the response method from the mobile payment, I need it to go into my API and automatically complete a transaction. Those are things that we had to build into our system ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in doing so, what kind of challenges in terms of technical things did you encounter with your development team? Well, the fact that one, we have a, an, a fully local development team. So the entire system from the shop side to the payments is all locally built. And one of the things you realize is that a lot of the, the things that we're able to research or benchmark against are not localized. So we can look at other, okay. other online shops. We can look at other online payment systems. We can look at best practices, but none of it includes a mobile payment like M-Pesa, which is a primary. Out of all of our transactions, probably 90 or 85% are run off of mobile payments vis-a-vis cards. And so mm. even if when you're thinking of things like those, it's how we, we build for our consumer, even our UX, our UI, all needs to be based on a consumer who's used to seeing things on a phone that could might be a feature phone even. So we've had to build based on variables that are very unique to this environment. But okay. also as a challenge, it's been that for this thing to work and to be as impactful as, as we've imagined it to be, it needs to be able to function in several markets. So we need to be able to scale out. And when you think about that, especially in the scenario we're in, it means the developer has to think in 
six different markets because nothing is easily replicated. It means that the same challenge we had with payments here, we have to go and overcome the same in every single market we go to. So, yeah. So now I'm wondering, as a non-technical founder of my startup, how are you able to assemble a team able to create such a system? Well, first it's God, <laughs> mm. I'd say, because it's just, I mean, we had we have a good vision and we have gone through our fair share of developers over the years just who are able to see what, what we're envisioning as non-tech background founders and be able to replicate that into the product. But also then we've been able to secure some good partnerships along the way who are able to help us on the places where we don't have our strengths. So for example, we work with Microsoft and they have a Microsoft for Africa program where they're able to give us technical support and they fly in competent Microsoft employees from the States, from Canada, from Egypt who work on building actual Microsoft products to come and work with our development team to clean up some of the stuff we do to make sure that it's global standard. So being able to get expertise that covers up for the things that we don't see or the languages that we don't speak has been a valuable thing for our company so far. Yes, and, and that's something actually I was going to touch upon in the next kind of few minutes. But now that we're talking about it, I mean, how were you able to hook up with them, Facebook and also Microsoft to get the help to build up your technical team and as well as build up features for your platform? Well, one, we're, we're in a market that has some good attention. A lot of people have their eye on Africa right now, and Africa is no longer the next frontier. It's the frontier of today. It's the frontier of now. And so a lot of these big organizations, as much as they're growing and expanding, are starting to, to see their elasticity in the in the American and European market and are looking to their next billion consumers coming from Africa. And while they do that, they're obviously looking for people who have started to set their foot, who they can learn from on some of the elements that are key to them. And so this is how we've been able to to interact. And it's it's all happened in a very short time, I'm telling you. This has all been yes. the last one year. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, we've had like maybe a couple of meetings with, with the Facebook team and been able to work with them to figure out certain elements, things like payments are are crucial right now in their global strategy. So that being a core of what we do now, how can we help them understand certain elements of the payment system on this side based on what they're doing? And the same thing with Microsoft. They have some very good products. We're in a world now where we can't be relying on, on physical storage or servers based on electricity and other little factors. So to be able to have partners who are able to to give us best practice on storage, on clouds, on on how we set up our systems in the back end, okay. backups and things like those is, is valuable, especially when you think of the scale that we're yes. trying to go to. Yeah. Okay. So going back to the whole kind of system and how MOOC works, if I'm a consumer and I've, I come into a, a store and it's run on MOOC yes. and I want to buy a product, if I'm correct, your system is able to interact directly with my SIM card. Correct. Yes. So, so now, yeah. One of the things when we were building, and I think this is the advantage of a non-tech element to, to how we designed the product. For us, we were coming with some of the frustrations that if you use M-Pesa, for example, on the mobile phone, the process of sending money from one user to the other one is a nine-step process. Oh, and wow. so and so it becomes really tiring because by the time you've gone to your menu, your menu has 10 options. You choose the service you want to start with, send money. It takes you to a page to, to select the number, put in the number, put in the amount, put in your PIN, confirm, confirm again, and then get to a message. For us, that was too tedious when you're online. I'm not going to be online and then take nine steps to make a payment. Number two, I don't want to go online and have to log in, which is a big cart abandonment problem. So all the websites that you see for e-commerce, once you get to the point where you need to pay, they tell you, hey, sign up to our platform 
and create your account. So that was a big element of cart abandonment that we thought to take out. And so as a customer, you come to this page, you've seen the link. It could be an event that's selling tickets. It could be a merchant selling physical products. The only details that we ask you to provide are your name, your email, and your phone number. So for each transaction, we collect those details as the unique identifiers of the transaction, okay. map it to that unique transaction. So each transaction gets its own ID. And once you've selected the number of items you want, and if it's a physical product, you put in your delivery location and it will calculate for you the fee based on where you are from the merchant. And if you select mobile payment, what we do is as opposed to making you have to go and do the nine step process and then come back and give us your confirmation, we have automated the system so that as soon as you initiate it on your mobile phone or your computer from our platform, it will automatically communicate into your SIM application and give you a pop-up that just asks you to confirm that you're trying to make a transaction of, for example, $10 to MOOC for transaction ID X. And you put in your PIN and your transaction is over. So we've cut down a nine-step process into a two-step process. That alone has changed our business dramatically. Okay. And if I'm quite close, so for that process, you're using short codes as opposed to using the customer's number. And that system was made by developers outside of Safaricom, the makers of M-Pesa. How does it work? Correct. So M-Pesa, as it was built, the system is made for users to send money from one SIM card to the other one. So it's, it's customer to customer. But over the years, developers have built onto the M-Pesa system. And one of the things that has grown it drastically over the years is the ability for then customers to be able to pay businesses. So a C2B version of the model where the business, as opposed to using a number like what we use, which is the 07 blah, blah, blah number, the businesses will get a short code that the customer is able to input in their M-Pesa menu and send money directly to that short code. And so the similar system of the short code is what we use online as well. But that was built by a separate developer and purely as a business solution from M-Pesa. So it's a spin-off of M-Pesa, but it's so widely used and so normal now that nobody imagines it as a spin-off. With Safaricom obviously kind of running and owning M-Pesa, how easy it is it for a developer to just maybe think of an idea like short code, for example, and then create something which is built on top of M-Pesa and then maybe either benefit from it financially or any other way? Well, technically, it's easy, okay? Because the platform is an open platform. It's used across devices. And the, the core of M-Pesa, it was not developed as a fully interactive payment system. It was built simply as a customer-to-customer -customer payment system. So there's okay. still a lot of opportunities for developers to build ways for this payment system to work in apps, for this payment system to work. Like now what we've done is plug it online and have an automatic online plugin. So there's a lot of opportunities for those spin-offs to still be built. However, again, with every ecosystem, there's then the politics around it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the better a product you build then the more Safaricom will need to or want to be involved just for the, the scale out of that to be viable. Dice.com will help you accelerate your tech career. Whether you're actively looking for a job or need insights to grow in your current role, Dice has the resources that you need. Dice's mobile app is the fastest and easiest way to get ahead. Search thousands of jobs from top companies. Discover your market value based on your unique skill set. Uncover new opportunities with Dice's new career pathing tool, which can give you insights about the best types of roles to transition to. Dice will even suggest the new skills that you'll need to make the move. Manage your tech career and download the Dice Careers app on Android or iOS today. And to check out the Dice website and support Software Engineering Daily, 
go to dice.com slash sedaily. You can find information about the Dice Careers app on dice.com slash sedaily, and it will also support Software Engineering Daily. Thanks to Dice for being a loyal sponsor of Software Engineering Daily, and if you want to find out more about Dice Careers, go to dice.com slash sedaily. Yeah, and I'll go back to MOOC a bit more. When you first started, you were selling, you're allowing merchants to sell products mm-hmm. on the platform. But now you've kind of evolved to also selling tickets, content, and also allowing people to take donations. Now, how were you able to scale up in such a way to kind of broaden your offering for your for your clients? So interestingly, actually, we built we built it for people who are selling physical products is who we built the system for. But as we were building it and we were testing and figuring out the logistics of it, one of the first people who approached us to be able to try and use our online system was an event, a festival actually, that was doing a two-day festival and they wanted to sell tickets purely online and they were looking for a new solution. And so what we did, we hadn't even launched the products at that point, we decided because for a ticket, it's a lot easier to fulfill the, the delivery than a physical product. All we need to do is get their name, email, phone number, and we'll email them back a ticket and figure out a way to scan the ticket at the door to verify it from our system. So we created some tweaks in about a week and, and put out our first event, and we ran, well, we run about fifteen or 1,600 transactions and maybe 700 of those were successful. But that was the first real run we had at running the system live. And from there, we've had about 300 different events set up on the platform since then. So eventing just became one of our biggest channels because that's where we started. But when we were building it, we had looked and our research online was based on what are the things that the consumers and businesses or merchants are interacting with the most online? So if there's conversations online about purchase, what are they based on? And a lot of them were based on tickets to events. A lot of it was based on music, especially in this part of the world where you have some artists who, I mean, you have a crop of maybe under 50 artists who are big across all of Africa and people are always trying to buy their music. But then there's all the smaller businesses that are popping up that, and especially if you look at the age bracket of like 17 to 30 or 17 to 27, everybody has a hustle where they're making a bag or they're making some t-shirts or they're making jewelry and they're trying to sell them within their network. And that's the primary person that we're targeting as our customer, as MOOC. It's all the people who are getting into this new businesses And they're trying to capitalize on the audience they already have. But they want a credible, efficient system for both them and their customers. Okay. So with regard to Kenya's development in its economy and technology, Mm -hmm. where does MOOC fit into that story? What part are you playing in that story? Well, the interesting thing, and I, I don't know if this is just a Kenya situation, but it's everywhere. You never get as much love in your own home turf as you do when you step out. So we get a lot of attention and a lot of great support from external partners, the Microsofts, the Facebook, and a few other people we work with. But then locally what happens is the merchants, and and this for us is a blessing, the merchants love us. The merchants see MOOC as a solution that will carry them and their businesses into this next online frontier. In terms of does the rest of the play work towards it, we're having to build that system. So we're the ones having to sit now with banks and with other telcos and be like, okay, let's let's evolve your model or let's evolve your product offering to be able to fit into what this business is and this customers are looking for. But we do have a very ripe online ecosystem here. We do have a huge number of people now on the internet in the country and they are interested in commerce, our spending power is growing, and especially among the younger people. So for us, it's to focus on who are the audience of the next five years, 
And if they're going to have spending power in five years, how do we grow them now from buying small event tickets for $10 or music for a dollar into buying all the products that they need to buy online in the next five, ten years, spending their months shopping through MOOC is the target. Okay. So with that in mind, what does the process of starting a tech startup in Kenya look like? What is an advantage of being based there? And also, what are the disadvantages of being based there as well? If I was to start with advantages, one, we live in, in a country where it's very easy to start new businesses. So the ease of, of opening up a new business, especially in the tech space, is very easy here. And especially now, even just outside of the tech, if you look at some of the merchants that we service, if you're looking at businesses that are trying to start and are not looking to get into the brick and mortar system, they're not trying to go and pay goodwill for a store in the central business district, they want to be able to start a business with the little money they have and be able to run transactions that will then help them grow. So if you look at that, we're in a perfect ecosystem because the merchants have audiences, the audiences have M-Pesa and they have all these other avenues available to them. So if this merchant can just get his products into a system like MOOC, he could easily be selling and collecting money without having to undergo like strict or like mad government taxes on goodwill and those things. However, if I'd say the disadvantage, it's, it's not really a Kenyan disadvantage, but I mean, fintech is still new and the traditional businesses, if I call the traditional businesses banks, the traditional businesses being money lenders and those people, it's not in their benefit to see online businesses thrive and grow because then we take out of their walk-in. And because businesses now have seen what the internet and technology has done to industrial businesses, especially if you look at the States, over the last couple of years, that fear means that conventional businesses are locking out the opportunities for what the, the new online businesses could bring. Okay. Now looking a bit into the future more and as to what's next. Earlier, you said that many Kenyans consider having a wallet on your phone a standard feature of Correct. what what phone they're using. Correct. How does that mentality affect the way developers? and founders create software and build companies? Well, there was an interesting article today in the newspaper where the central bank was intervening on a new product that is being developed for technology and it's being done as a collaboration of banks. And what's happening is that the central bank told this conglomerate of banks that if you guys want to get into the space where you do online transactions or mobile transactions, you need to be able to compete on things like efficiency. And so what's happening is we've become so aware that even as we build, the things we're looking at is how do we reduce the steps? How do we make the process more efficient? How do we make sure that transactions can happen in under 10 seconds, for example? So developers have been forced to think and code around or not even have been forced, but are now able to think around things that are monetizable because it's very easy for the consumer to pay for something. And because everyone now has a phone and we're now moving into the phase where because everybody has a basic phone, a lot of the market is now moving up into smartphones and into better phones. So even developing apps and different little things that can be used on these different phones that are completely localized is a huge opportunity for, for the developers. So what do you think other parts of the world can learn from this approach to creating new technology and innovation? I think one of the biggest things is that like adoption can happen very rapidly. So if you look at things like Bitcoin, for example, or even credit cards, which have been around for a while, the understanding in the financial services world is that it takes a while to get all these consumers to adopt. Everybody's going to be fraudulent. We're going to fall into problems. There will be money laundering. But yet, if you look on the flip side, it's these consumers are more awake. These consumers, the demand is a lot higher. And so 
I think there's a lot that, that we still have to learn and, and we're just at the budding stage. As much as it's been a decade, we're still at the budding stage of this of this product. And so there's still a lot that we're going to see and learn from just how the users are interacting with these platforms. You briefly mentioned Bitcoin in your answer just now. Mm -hmm. What role is it playing in Africa in the mobile payment space at the moment? None. None. Because everybody considers it so foreign. And that's the same thing they thought would happen to things like mobile wallets. That it feels like such a foreign concept or something so new and so out there that the adoption of it becomes slow. But when you look at a format of where this wallet are part of the SIM card, for example, it's not a new thing you need to go and sign up to. It already exists in your everyday life. And the fact that 30 million people are using it gives it the clout that a Bitcoin won't have. The fact that I can walk to the local grocery lady across the street and I could pay her with, with this mobile virtual currency but I, if I walked up to her and I told her I want to give her some bitcoins, she'd probably think I'm crazy. <laughs> but so the fact that we've been able to adopt it on customer to customer, customer to business, business to business as a payment model, it's very rare for that in what we could call new currencies. So you're having a, a new currency that's come and overtaken all the things that are looking to be the new global currencies. So projects like BitPesa, which is the Kenyan Bitcoin exchange. Are they failing at the moment? Are they successful? Or what is their current state? I'd say if you look anywhere, there's always going to be products or people that develop around existing things in the hope of them blowing up and capitalizing. So I think BitPesa and them are made for if Bitcoin blows up, we need a way to be able to capitalize and convert it quickly into what we already know. But if I was to take Bitcoins or, and, or, and any other spin-off that we do of them and compare it to the mobile wallets that we have for Africa, the mobile wallets are going to win. Okay. Yeah. So with the M-Pesa, if I'm correct, currently there's a limit to how much money you can hold at any one time on your wallet. Correct. It's about $1,000. Okay. Does this in any way hinder the levels at which consumers and merchants can trade? Yes and no. And no would be the stronger answer there because if you look at online, especially in a young economy, so we're, we're also in, in not in a place where somebody is going to go online and buy Jimmy Choo's for $6,000. We were in an economy where a lot of the transactions that are happening are in the range of under $500. If you're looking at products, tickets, and in any one single transaction on M-Pesa or on this mobile wallet, you're able to do up to $700. So if all I'm buying is a ticket that's $15, $20, or I'm buying a product that's even $50 or $200, I'm able to run these transactions off of my mobile phone without a hustle. So the bigger things which would require me to spend more than $1,000, we still haven't gotten to the point yet where the consumer and the seller trust each other online to do such transactions over a platform. So you'll find globally, globally I think the limit as to what people are transacting online, especially from a custom business to customer, works within the under 700 range which we play with on the mobile money. Do you see this limit increasing at all in the future? Yes, the the thing I was just talking about, the bank, the bank wallet that they've just created with the 23 bank conglomerate, they let you move up to a million, which is about $10,000. That's interesting, I said, because I saw a video online this week mm -hmm. about that subject, and I, and I think it was the Kenyan Bankers Association yes. that were coming together to basically try and break the stranglehold that M-Pesa has exactly. on the market. Exactly. And this is, this is not something new because when you, when you look at, like, for example, in the South, what has happened over the last couple of years is that economies have learned the advantages and disadvantages of allowing a player, a telco player, for example, like Safaricom, to get into the mobile money space and dominate it. So today, Safaricom is one of the highest earning businesses in our country. 
and three quarters of that revenue comes from M-Pesa transactions. Oh, so wow. what has happened is you go into countries like Namibia or you go into other countries in, in the southern parts of Africa and the banks have worked with the CBK and the regulators there, the central banks and the regulators, to be able to block out the telcos from running financial platforms. So those systems, what is the mobile wallets, are run by banks as opposed to telcos. And so now here the banks are coming on as a rebattle, but they're the last player coming in. And because we've had maybe four or five other phone networks that have been active over the last couple of years, none of them has been able to steal even 20% market share from M-Pesa. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So the bank, the banks have taken it upon themselves now. Yes, that's, that's interesting, actually. And um, just one other thing as well. When I was looking online, I'm just reading stuff on one of your co-founders, I think it was it Eric Timber? Correct. He's was, was our CEO. Was, yeah. Yes, he, he was quoted in an article saying that companies in Africa need to start thinking about making solutions which are not only local, but can be continental-wide as well as worldwide. Correct. Now, how is MOOC set up to achieve this goal? Okay, so I'll, I'll paint a picture for you. Right now, if you're a merchant who's based in Kenya and you make a product that, for example, is a T-shirt, an Africa T-shirt, Africa is now, and you have an audience in Uganda, you have an audience in Tanzania, you have your audience in Kenya, you have an audience in, for example, Zambia. There are two problems that come with being able to fulfill that audience. The first one is, is a currency or a payment problem. And that's one of the first things MOOC is fixing. So for you as a merchant, how do I ensure that you can set up your product onto the platform and you set it up in a currency? For example, your base currency will be dollars. And for us as a platform, it's to ensure that the customer in whichever country they are in can pay you the equivalent of your $10 in whichever currency they are in, whether it's Kenya shillings, South African rand, Tanzanian shillings, and you will get your money settled to you in your dollars. So you will always get your $10 per transaction, no matter what currency we've paid in, because that's your first hurdle as a business. If you try and figure out how do I get customer X to send me Rand and customer Y to send me Kenya shillings and make sure they all balance, the region doesn't allow for that. But number two is the logistics. It's how do we move products across borders? And that's one of the challenges that we're getting into as we build the 2.0 version of MOOC. It's how do we figure out we can help all these businesses with their logistical nightmares of moving products across borders. So it's fixing payment and then fixing the logistics. But in terms of, of audience and reach, the internet has already done an excellent job and the social media has done like excellent job of connecting and breaking those borders so that me and my audience, no matter where they are, are always connected. So how many countries are you currently in then in Africa? Well, we built and tested in Kenya, so we're fully operational here with all four platforms. And we've tested the ticketing system in both Nigeria and Namibia last year. Each of them had unique unique and interesting opportunities and challenges. Nigeria is one of the biggest markets in Africa. So for us, setting our foot in there and testing the water and seeing what kind of response we get was very important because it tells us if it's a market we're able to scale into. And then Namibia for us was key because it is a very small market, 2 million population, about half a million in the capital city and their average age is 19 years old. So it's, it's smack on the kind of audience we'd be looking at globally. However, they also operate in an environment which is completely different from Kenya. So where we have a dominant mobile player here, they have two equal bank players that are competing on the same field. So being able to integrate into those banks, integrate into systems that are more offline, because in Nairobi, again, our mobile phone penetration has been heavy. Every single person, young, old, in the village, in the urban cities, has a mobile phone or two. 
And so because everybody is already connected, everybody uses their mobile phone to get access to all these services. You go into a place like Namibia where some people still are not using their mobile phones or they have feature phones and so they will only access certain services from a physical vending location. How do we make sure our system can work in those environments as well? So for us, it's been a heavy learning curve and a lot of our system and our features are based from use cases. So being able to test it in as many use cases is key for us. Okay. So for developers who are listening to this podcast and who, who might be based in the West where maybe paying on mobile is not as big a thing as it is in Africa and Kenya, what can they do to reach that audience with their services and their products? I mean, how easy is it for me, for example, to put an app and take payments from M-Pesa? So those are some of the things we're trying to solve. How can we create easy gateways for developers to plug in? Another thing we realized is and when we realized this as, our, as we were building our payment platform, some of these payment aggregators make it a nightmare for developers. It's almost like they give you the documentation and you want to lose your mind at how difficult <laughs> it is to plug into them. So one of our cores has always to be build as if you're building um, for the developer and to make his work super easy. If we needed to do the most complicated integration of a MOOC interface into a thing, it wouldn't take more than an hour. And so we have been working to just make sure that we make it super easy. But for developers, I'd say, yo, the audience is here. You have a billion people who are stuck on the internet, who are very alert, who have learned a lot by observation. And so they, they are in line with you. They like the exact same trends you like. And they are curious enough to adopt at a rate that you will not find anywhere else. And so if nothing else, build it. Look to us to help you figure out the M-Pesa and how it works. I'm happy to ask, answer any questions and what, but it's definitely an avenue to look at. And once we're able to break this new borderless currency, which is what we want to make MOOC, it, we want to make it just anywhere in Africa where you go. If you say MOOC, people will be able to acknowledge that as a payment system and then we can open that up to the world okay and i guess just to kind of close off the, the interview um besides mooc what other cool startups in kenya should the world watch out for over the next few years whoa that's a big one because <laughs> i know that for example mark Zuckerberg from facebook came to kenya was it last yes. year and he met up with mooc and other companies that were kind of working in, in, in different spaces. Correct. So we, I mean, we have done a lot of things and, and technology has played an interesting role. So we are now in a city where agribusiness, for example, is being driven by, by technology. One of the businesses that, that met Mark along with us is called Twiga and they okay. do food deliveries and they figured out a way to map the product from the farm to the market so that you're able to see the best price to the farmer and you're able to, to route your product from the marketplace directly to the farmer so that then we're able to know that this person who's growing it sustainably, that we're supporting a guy who lives in place X. So there's, there's all these little apps that are being built and a lot are being built for businesses. So where I'd say the gap is and the things to look out for is now... There's a lot of apps being built. Uber is here now, and I hear the term a lot, the Uber of tailoring or the Uber of motorbikes, motorbike rides. So there's all these people <laughs> who are building what is the quickest way to, to order and get and access, whether it's information or services. And as much as some of them are just like spin-offs or replicas of existing systems, there's bound to be a lot of very clever ones. Man, I'll probably need to like write you a, a, a <laughs> semi-article, a mini-article, and just list some people to watch. I'll, I'll I definitely need to put that down for you. No, that's fine. Well, thanks a lot yeah. for that. So people, if they want to get hold of you, how can they reach you? Well, you can, you can check up our website. We've tried to put as much information over there. The website is mymook.com. That's M-Y-M-O-O-K-H mymook.com we have an email account over there that you can reach us at that's hello at mymook and if you want to reach me directly my email address is poji at mymook 
And I'm always happy to chat payments, man. Africa is the next frontier and we all need to get into it. Okay, fantastic. Thanks a lot for that, um, George. And all the best with MOOC in the future. Thank you, Carl, man. Much appreciated. Thank you for the time and looking forward to share more with the developers anytime y'all are ready. (laughs) Great stuff. Thanks to Symphono for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other. Check it out at symphono.com slash sedaily. That's S-Y-M-P-H-O-N-O dot com slash sedaily. Thanks again, Symphono. Wow.